Okay, thank you so much, Janelle and Miguel. So I will be introducing our three speakers for the evening, beginning with Klaus Ottman. Klaus Ottman is Chief Curator and Deputy Director for Academic Affairs at the Phillips Collection in Washington, DC, and the publisher and editor of Spring Publications. At the Phillips, he has curated the exhibitions Nordic Impressions, Art from Oland, Denmark, the Faroe Islands, Finland, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden from 1821 to 2018. George Kondo, The Way I Think, Arlene Sheckett, From Here On Now, Carl Appel, A Gesture of Color, Hiroshi Sugimoti, Sugimoto, Conceptual Forms and Mathematical Models, Angels, Demons, and Savages, Pollock, Osorio, Dubuffet, and Per Kirkby, Paintings and Sculpture. And he oversaw the installation of the Philips' new permanent installation, A Wax Room, created by Wolfgang Leib. Dr. Ottman has curated more than 60 international exhibitions, including Jennifer Bartlett, History of the Universe, works from 1970 to 2011, Still Points of the Turning World, Site Santa Fe's Sixth in International uh, Biennial, Life, Love, and Death, the work of James Lee Byers, Wolfgang Leib, A Retrospective, and Strange Attractors, The Spectacle of Chaos. His publications include Eve Klein, by himself, his life and thought, the genius decision, the extraordinary and the postmodern condition, and the essential Mark Rothko. In 2006, he translated and edited Eve Klein's complete writings, overcoming the problematics of art, the writing of Eve Klein, and in 2010, he translated F. W. J. Schelling's Philosophy and Religion, originally published in 1804. In 2016, Dr. Ottman was conferred the insignia, insignia of Chevalier of France's Order of Arts and Letters. And Dr. Ottman received an MA in philosophy from the Free Universität Berlin, Germany, and a PhD in philosophy from the Division of Media and Communications at the European Graduate School in Sassfe, Switzerland. So welcome, Dr. Ottman. Valerie Smith is a curator, art historian, and writer living and working between Berlin and New York. She was the curator at Artists Space throughout the 1980s, specifically 82 to 89, and co-edited 5,000 Return to Artists Space 25 years in 1998. In the early 1990s, she moved to Arnhem, the Netherlands, to be the director of Sonsbeck 93, a recurring international exhibition. She returned to New York City as director of exhibitions and senior curator for the Queens Museum of Art from 1999 to 2008, where she organized numerous exhibitions, among them Down the Garden Path, The Artist's Garden After Modernism, for which received the Emily Hall Tremaine Curatorial Award, Joan Jonas, Five Works, for which received the International Art Critics Award. Moving to Berlin, Germany, as head of the visual arts, film, and media at Haus der Kulturen der Welt, she initiated Labor Berlin, a platform for foreign-born Berliners, and curated rational slash internet irrational, and between walls and windows, architecture and ideology, among, among many other exhibitions, notably Juan Downey, the, Art, the Invisible Architect in 2012, a touring exhibition for the Liszt Visual Arts Center at MIT. She has been teaching exhibition histories at Barnard College, Columbia University since 2014, and recently published a monograph on Amy Silman for Lund Humphreys, London, 2019. She is currently writing a book on obscure 19th century drawings. So welcome, Valerie. And we have Lily Siegel. Lily Siegel is the executive director at Hamiltonian Artists, a nonprofit fellowship program and gallery in DC dedicated to building a dynamic community of innovative artists and effective visual leaders. Before joining Hamiltonian, she was executive director and curator at Greater Reston Art Center, also known as GRACE, and held curatorial positions at the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. She is the guest curator of both Meyer Dreyer exhibitions on view at the Phillips and at GRACE. 
So thank you all so much for being here and I'm going to turn it over to you for your conversation. Thank you. Um, thank you all for those introductions. Thank you to Klaus and Valerie for being here. And um, I know it's unusual, but I want to start this conversation with some more thank yous because I peeked at the guest list of participants who are here joining us tonight. And it's really so many friends who I have met along the way of putting this exhibition together. And I really want to express my sincerest thanks to all of you for your support and all of the great conversations that we have had. Um, also, I don't think we would be here without the Warhol Foundation and their early support of my research for this exhibition and then again supporting this exhibition. Um, so really heartfelt thanks. And I was thinking tonight we would just have a conversation because like I said, I've had so many great ones <laughs> over the course of this um, project and some of the better ones with Klaus and Valerie. And so I'm really pleased and honored to share some more of those thoughts with you all tonight. Um, I think we'll just jump right in and acknowledge Klaus and Valerie, you both wrote for the catalog for this exhibition. Valerie, you, I know, primarily knew Moira as a dear friend and had curated her into some shows, but had never really had never written about her work. And Klaus, you knew her as well and curated her into shows and published an interview with her. So I just wanted to start um, and ask you both to talk about how you got to know Moira and admire her work and um, what led to your decades long commitment to her practice and her work. Go ahead, Valerie. <laughs> you want me to go ahead? Okay. Sure. Um, well, I, I first met Moira through Victor, Elsa Moira, her, her husband. And, um, I, you know, I don't even remember putting her into a show, but I think, Lily, you corrected that. And I, I did. <laughs> I probably put her into, a, you know, one of those big group artist-based, you know, shows. Exactly. Um, and because I think... Let's see, I was there from, I want to say, 82 to 89, and um, she was already, I think, having shows or about to have shows. So whenever it was that I put her into one of these group shows that um, Artist Space was so um, famous for, uh, she she was on the cusp, if not already there, um, uh, beginning to show commercially, and of course that that was a no no in um, for artist space. Um, you really couldn't show artists that had you know had that kind of representation. But she snuck in, and so um, so that's how I got to know her, both of them as a couple, and um, and. Uh, we had a lifelong friendship. Um, I mean, I would go to her studio, um, of course, um, give my two bits, but we, it was, she was a girlfriend, you know, she was my girlfriend, my closest friend. So in a way, all of that kind of um, was uh, pushed aside, you know, um, I mean, I'd give my opinions about her work or I, I really supported her work always, but um, we didn't have that curator uh, artist relationship. It was more a very close, um, yeah, she was my closest friend, I, I would say. So. so I didn't know Moira quite that long. I also would never claim to be, to have been a, a friend. Um, I uh, did write about her uh, pretty early, uh, at least early in my career. And uh, I, I met her and spent time in her studio and then did that interview for the Journal of Contemporary Art. Um, I remember, I don't remember all that much about her uh, on a personal level. She, I remember she was incredibly nice and 
it was about 32 years ago in 1988, uh, after some time after I did that interview with her, that I got married. And uh, she surprised Leslie and me with um, giving us a drawing as a gift, um, you know, because we, we really weren't that close. And, uh, and of course, that drawing is now in, the, in a show at, at Reston. And, uh, and that was a lovely gesture. Uh, and I put her in a couple of shows. Uh, I was just really blown away by her kind of uh, vision and the way how she approached painting in a very different way uh, than, than most um, uh, people at the time did. Uh, and uh, so much of what uh, artists have been doing much later on is um, mixing sculpture with painting and photography and drawing and all of this. People like Rachel Harrison or even Jessica Stockholder. Um, she kind of started doing that so early on and, uh, and I was very attracted to that kind of work. And, and that's what uh, made me put her in this exhibition and uh, uh, in these exhibitions. The first one I think was the one I did at John Good Gallery. And it's wonderful to see one of the pieces that was in that exhibition, the one that MoMA owns, the NBC Nightly News, uh, now at the Phillips Collection. Uh, and I was very happy that, that we were able to do that. Yes, one of the things that came up very regularly in conversation was her generosity and um, kind of her excitement about life and Valerie you write in your essay about really how you see all of her life and things she surrounded herself with come out in her work um, and I think again that line between painting and sculpture and life and art and um, you both mentioned that in your writing for this catalog and I also wonder um, along those lines, and especially as we sit here today watching the news cycle, um, speaking of NBC Nightly News, mm -hmm. she was very, seemed very aware of um, current events and very interested in popular culture and a voracious consumer looking through her archives, there are news clippings and Xeroxes from books and um, references to literature. Are those conversations that you had with her in her studio or as a friend? Mm. God, you're putting me on the spot. I mean, <laughs> um, I think they were much more personal, um, our kinds of conversations. I, I think we did speak about art, but. I, I can't remember exactly what was said. It was mainly what someone was doing as opposed to another person. Um, yes, she was a voracious, voracious uh, you know, consumer of books and, um, and everything. I mean, she, she looked at things to, to use. I think um, in terms of, um, well, I think that was always there, uh, but it probably um, reached another level when um, she had um, a relationship with someone who worked for the news. So, um, uh, but uh, then, you know, I, I, I it's, it's hard to say, you know, I, I think maybe this question of addressing the um, the element of sculpture in her painting or, or or objects in her painting is an interesting one because I know that some people feel that she might have gone all the way um, more into the painting sculpture. I mean, she was you know Jessica Stockholder, but Jessica was not. Um, I don't know how well she knew Jessica, um, uh, but there were other artists that were going in that direction. I'm wondering if if that, um, I mean, towards the end, I don't, I, I think um, really in the 
early 90s, uh, she may have been more into um, maybe painting was an, enough. Um, just, you know, just the, the, um, the surface. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just, I have a feeling. Um, I, I'm just curious about what you guys think um, about that. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, 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 I mean, of course we can speculate all, all we want about that, um, but um, I, I feel that she, it, it, she was, I, I don't know what, I mean, she was moving towards sculpture, but she had permission to do that from Elizabeth, from so many people um, and encouraged in that way. But I'm wondering, um, you know, this question of whether it was enough just to have a, a surface, um, um, a, be a painter. I mean, certainly it didn't satisfy her or she felt somehow it wasn't enough, but yet at the end or like towards the 90, 91, um, I felt that it was, I don't know. Plus, do you wanna sh show some of the images? In the yeah. Sorry, I forgot. I'm in control of this. <laughs> I think, Valerie, I think that's a really good point. And um, as I was thinking about this exhibition, I was really interested in showing the more sculptural works, works that could have been considered sculptures, not paintings, though they are still so much painting, um, to the point that we actually couldn't borrow oh. two of them, the two um, others besides NBC Nightly News, because the surfaces were so delicate that they were not stable enough to travel. Um, and so, and those were both completed in 1990. And then she seemed to move back to the painted surface in a more traditional um, sense of such. So. I think there was this exploration, but always a very tight grasp on paint and painting and the surface. What do you think, Klaus? Yeah, and so when I met her, um, I, I wasn't, you know, at, well, it was at that, not really at that time yet, but I, I never really was aware of her illness and all this until she died. Um, and, but I remember, you know, in the interview, we focused primarily on talking about that kind of prop character of her work and the, her background in, in a theater and and uh, um, and I I did ask her uh, in terms of theater you know is it about comedy or, or tragedy so to me it, it feels now retrospectively more that it, it was more about comedy at the time when I knew her when she was doing a work like um, uh, NBC Nightly News and then in in, in the later years uh, it was more about grief and about tragedy. And uh, and yes, it was definitely, she was focusing more on, on painting. Uh, but even then, you know, that there, there was always this, this kind of quirkiness and this strange uh, sense of humor in, in the work. One thing I wanted to mention too is I was very surprised when I, um, my first studio visit, because she, she had that studio and, Times Square, if I remember correctly, right? And it was like in the middle of, of all this, you know, it was, was not how Times Square is now. And uh, and she, uh, and I was surprised by that, uh, but she, you know, but it, it retrospectively, again, it makes a lot of sense. So she was absorbing all of that uh, environment in her work. But my favorite thing really about both of those shows has been this this ephemeral material, like what you see there in that case. Uh, it was so incredibly interesting for me to see all this um, material that she collected and that she was inspired by. I don't know if we have other images of that. I mean, when you look at some of these paintings, um, they're coming already off the wall. She had this gigantic, heavy, very heavy structure behind them. So they're already lifted off the wall. They're not like canvases, like a, are flat up against the, the wall. They, they come off. So they already 
were objects. They were already a presence. Um, I, I wonder why she felt that she had to somehow have a kind of prop prompt. I think of it as a prompt almost because there's this kind of narrative voice saying, you should be doing, you know, it's about this, it's about that, you know, it's sort of like an in indexical thing um, that sort of reveals what the painting is, but it was enough just to have it. I mean, like that, that, um, is it an, unt I can't remember the name, of the, the green one, which I love so much there, um, this rectangle, I mean, how existential can you get? It's just, fantastic uh, it's so it's an empty space i mean scary super scary um i mean and moving and 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 um but at the same time you know very um yeah this is a whole nother topic um i would say conceptual very conceptual i mean i think she was very much aware of that you know this question of how do I become a conceptual painter? It, does such a thing exist? And I think people are still, I mean, you talk about the relevance today. That's, if there's any reason, you know, if there's any, I mean, there are lots of reasons, but if that is a big one, why I think she's so important um, is because she really tried to carve out that, um, you know, that niche for herself. How can I be a conceptual painter? Um, I don't know what you think about that, but. I think, well, two things. I think that comment about space and that she is painting an em empty space really resonates for me. And um, the idea of being a conceptual painter um, that sounds so heavy, but <laughs> there seems to be, as Klaus said, such a sense of humor in a lot of this work. And I think, um, you know, the void, the empty space that she is painting in these, in shades of green, um, unusual color choices. And there are a lot of references in her notes to creating her own language around color choices. And we see the same colors used over and over again in her work, but she never lets on to the meaning of the colors. I don't think it was kind of her, her secret, um, a, almost an inside joke to herself, it seemed to me as I was reading through her notes. And this idea of, could she position herself as a conceptual painter? Um, and she might be the only one to hold the key and thinking about also how that could relate to her explorations of sculpture and um, pushing in one direction to then find her way back to where she wanted to go. She was definitely a, a conceptual artist I and mean, first and foremost, but, but one that, you know, but, but she was also someone who who was very, very sensual and was able to work with color in a very sensual uh, way. And I think that was one of her strengths. Yeah, I think it, she always had that, you know, in a way I think she gets back to, in the later work, she gets back to the very first landscape, seascape works um, that she did. Um, where, you know, like for instance, this one, um, the fingerprint um, kind of strategy that she had, which uh, started very simply and then evolved. Um, she's doing so much in that, that single painting. Um, this, you know, talk about signature, talk about body or who I am or the idea of I am here as a painting, you know, as a painting, um, but some, there's also the body and the sense of, of an interior um, self there. The, the painting part has to do with this kind of Ryman-esque, you know, um, 
uh, what do you call them? You know, in something that nails it down okay. as a painting. Um, this other stuff is um, very elu uh, elusive um, body like. Uh, so it is performative, but you see, it's enough just to have a painting and how it comes off the wall. Uh -huh. She didn't need the prop. She didn't need that other True. Um, uh, box aspect um, in, in this one and in many of them. It was enough just, just like this. And to me, there's also, in, <clears throat> like in a painting like this, there's also a kind of emotional distance and that's in a lot of her work. So this painting, you know, kind of looks a little bit like, almost like a Ross Blackner, for instance, but it doesn't have that romantic, a romanticism that, that his work often has. Uh, and his work also dealt a lot with death and dying and, and things like that. But, but uh, more, there is, there is a certain distancing um, that kind of really focuses on, on form and color uh, and kind of removes it away from a, from this kind of emo easy emotional um, um, content. <clears throat> yeah, she was remarkable that way, I think. I mean, she was. Uh, I mean, I really see her in that work and this mm -hmm. idea of um, kind of uh, a reserve. Um, and maybe that's where the conceptual part comes in mm -hmm. because it's not, you know, she spent so much time um, with, you know, people like Julian and, and Ross and, and where there is, um, it, it's more on your sleeve kind of thing and here, but she wasn't like that um, mm -hmm. as a person and that uh, kind of analytic um, um, Maybe it has to do with this, it's almost like um, a kind of uh, step back and thinking about, about how to present, um, you know, I, I, I wanna say again, um, how do I present the self? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but with a remove, with this kind of um, looking at myself from an, from another you know another angle where looking at myself look at myself kind of thing I, I don't know exactly how else to put it but yeah. a, a, a kind of maybe self consciousness um, but not in a pretentious way at all you know so this is the show out in resting. Uh -huh. um, to which you were both generous lenders. And I know the works came off of the walls in your homes as did so many of these. So thank you for um, sharing them with fewer people, unfortunately, than we were expecting. Um, but this exhibition was put together uh, primarily with loans from friends and family and works that were gifted by Moira directly. Um, and speaking about her putting herself into the work and also the um, more analytic approach, I think it's also important to note that that is the background she came from, mathematicians and architects and um, very analytic thinkers in her family. And especially this piece that is on the screen now to the right, my right, so I assume everyone else is right, that looks like um, a spectrum of light. I found a reference to that in her archive that it was cut out of a scientific magazine. So I think um, she was a conceptual artist and I think she was also a conceptual thinker um, outside of her practice and thought a lot about the way things function in the world and the structures that we um, surround ourselves with. 
this is a little bit off topic from that, but I've been asked a few times by people about whether her work can be seen as political and whether she would have considered her work political, you know, in the time that she was making the work and active in New York, um, AIDS activism and post-feminism and all of these different political movements in the arts. And um, I don't feel comfortable saying she wasn't political, but I also don't feel comfortable saying her work is, or it would fit into those categories. Hmm. I'm not sure what to say. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, um, you know, certainly she had strong opinions about, you know, what was going on um, in the world. And, um, and that was a, it was a heady time, of course, the 80s um, for the art world. Um, and, um, and the, let's see, the well-being of, I mean, lots of people were dying, let's just put it that way, from AIDS. She certainly knew that was, um, it was part of the scene that we all lived through. Um, uh, did it come directly into the work? Um, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say so. But certainly there is, um, you know, towards the end, um, I think there is some kind of, uh, she's taking a stand, you know. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what does it mean to be political? You know, how does that manifest itself? It can manifest itself in so many different ways. Um, and, uh, yeah, I wouldn't, you know, to say that she wasn't, it, that's maybe false also, because, um, you know, she clearly had strong opinions, but I don't think it, it, it came out so, um, in such any kind of obvious way. Um, I mean, I mean, maybe you could call this whole prop, prompt kind of box things as a kind of political statement about, you know, about the act of painting, uh, if you want to stretch it that way. Um, I don't know, what do you think, Klaus? Yeah, so, well, it's obviously, you know, every artist is, is political because artists live in, in society and uh, absorb society and, and it, it ultimately always comes is visible in their work. Uh, I, it's hard to, to make uh, theories. I never discussed it with her, but again, now after having seen these shows, I've been thinking about the props and about the, you know, she, she clearly, you know, um, did a lot of trips to Chinatown or to, to hardware stores. And she was fascinated by some of these, um, these, um, uh, things that she then attached or used for her paintings. And to me, that there's, there's almost like a feminine and an and other, I'm not sure we can say this anymore, a feminine and a, and a masculine aspect in her work. And, and I've always kind of felt that, that these, uh, these props and these gadgets and these things that she uh, found and then used were kind of a, counter, a counterpoint to the more feminine painting which, I, but that's that's just a theory that I have. So in that sense, I think one could say that that there is a uh, you know a, a kind of a feminist aspect to the work. Um, but oh, also, I I'm also really interested in the you know I was so interesting to see these these headlines that she cut out and that you used as an inspiration for the titles of the shows. And so she you know she clearly you know was very involved in the world and and uh, and that's very very obvious sorry i was interrupting you no 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 i was i just wanted to say that i you know 
we're all made up of the masculine and feminine, you know, it's just a matter of how we emphasize it, or, you know, what we decide, even if it's a decision that one can even make, you are what you are, and you go in one direction or another direction or both, um, and how it manifests in your work. I think, I think the painting is just as, you know, um, you know, masculine, if you want to say that, as as mm -hmm. the props or vice versa. You know, um, I'm I'm what I'm curious about is um, there's been something mentioned. Of, um, I think Mary maybe Barry mentioned it, and and I hadn't realized or hadn't you know. I mean, I do think about it because of the piece that she gave me. Um, that the, what was kind of unique to her, I think, was the 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 painting on the um, on the wooden panel, and how it soaked into that um, panel, and uh, it, it that she must have worked that really a, quite a bit for it to even because it soaks in for it to come out visually um, and it, so it, you know the, the whole technique of applying that um, is a it's hard labor um, I guess is probably what I want to say and um, what is interesting about that is that it keeps on disappearing um, it's they're veils they're not it's not paint on canvas that um, is sort of very much present. Um, it 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 sort of elusive, um, and I, uh, this is mainly for the later work. Um, and I I was curious what you thought about that because I I I I think that's quite unique, um, or very much about her work, the kind of work she was doing towards the end or late 80s, uh, early 90s. Yeah, so it, it, it's very true. I think she, she painted really against the material. Uh, you know, the, whatever she used, the, the, the plywood, the, the fabrics, the different surfaces that she, she used, uh, they were not really supports in the sense as a, as a traditional canvas would be. And there's always a struggle and uh, and uh, they're not uh, as forgiving. And I think it's, uh, I, I think that's, that's all part of what makes the work so, so unusual. Yeah, I mean, those later pieces, the veils of color mm -hmm. um, are just so fantastic, just, um, in and of themselves, she, 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 she didn't need any kind of found um, object mm -hmm. to make it work. I mean, this is already a kind of found object. It's a, yeah. it's a sign. It's a sign of a sign, you know, it's, it's, um, it's this kind of, and she maybe even mentions it in one of her notes, this business of rustication or the rustic or kind of twin peaks kind of thingy going on. Um, uh, it's, a, it's funny, it's poppy, it's really poppy, but the surface is so, so um, thin. It's, it, it's, it's, it, it's quite, um, you know, so beautiful. You just want to sink into it. Um, uh, and it, in, in a funny way, I know what has been mentioned, I think I want again to go back to Barry's um, wonderful uh, article um, in the New York Review of Books or New York Review, I, think, I can't remember now, but um, he, he talks about, uh, um, I've lost my train of thought now, but he, what we were talking about, uh, the, somehow, you're talking about this. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry, I better, mm. 
I've, 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 I've lost it now. There was something that he mentioned mm -hmm. that I wanted to make reference to, but I, it, maybe it'll come later. <laughs> Sorry. Mm. Um, so Lily, did you have any special, anything, a, any favorites after, oh. after <laughs> those, you know, that is a very hard question. I think um, every single time we opened a crate, I loved that one the most. Oh. Um, I think I will always remember my first experience of seeing one of her works, and it was the wall of fear in um, the MoCA. Los Angeles collection. And um, so that one will always be a favorite. And I think being able to spend time with multiple works in the beautiful galleries, I feel so lucky that we were able to um, use that beautiful gallery at the Phillips with the high ceilings wow. and the windows and it grace the light that comes in, it's really hard to pick a favorite. I would say it changes every time <laughs> I experience a new work. Do you have favorites? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think my, my favorite remained that nightly, you know, NBC News one. That was always to me a very, a very special piece. And seeing it again, kind of just kind of reinforced it to me. I I, I recall what I was going to say earlier. Um, I think Barry mentioned um, Tip Dun Carol Dunham um, mm -hmm. as a possible influence for for the painting, and uh, this idea of uh, somehow uh, I think he mentioned maybe I'm misquoting him, but um, the the paint come up uh, the the support, the wooden support coming through the painting. But um, I wanted to kind of switch gears on that and say that I um, remember very strongly, at least it, it still is in my head, um, Sherry Levine's um, uh, plywood paintings or whatever they were, where the, the little, the, the, you know, how, plywood sometimes has has those little irregularities in the in the the pressing of it so it, it come they come out they're visible um, as sheets of plywood there are these little kind of lozenge shapes um, and she was playing off of that or sherry has a whole um, body of work that is dealing with that and I wouldn't be at all surprised if, um, uh, or maybe I even, I'm, this is coming up because we had, a, we had a conversation about that, or we might have even seen the show together. But um, I, I, um, I mean, she'd been working on panels for quite some time, but she, it, there, there are some in which the, the support really comes out much more. Mm -hmm. And she, she, she's working with that. Um, anyway, I can see that. I, I definitely can see that. And and then there are some some painters who who prefer painting on wood because it's it's it doesn't give in as much. It's harder. Uh, but those those paintings, those artists, when you look at the surfaces, they're usually extremely meticulous and very perfect and and very. Um, and 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 you know the 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 wood completely disappears, but with Moira, you know the it's it's more about this give and take, about the struggle with the material, and the, the there's never any doubt that this is uh, painted on wood. It's it's very clear. It's uh, and uh, and I th or when she paints on on a piece of fabric like that little blue painting back there, um, you see the stripes through. I mean, she doesn't hide that, and it's. Uh, I think that's. So I I, I can see that um, connection with the uh, Sherry Levine's, where she gilts the little eyes or whatever that's called. 
in the in the plywood. Yeah, I just wanted to, it's sort of a shout out to to Sherry and this idea of the conceptual rather than um, you know uh, uh, um, Carol Dunham's work, although that could also have been you know an influence. But I I, I have a feeling she was looking. I mean. She, there, she Sherry was a model um, uh -huh. for that generation of women, women artists. Well, yeah, there is a little bit of that cartoony elements in her work, and but I think you know she was very influenced by Elizabeth Mary, obviously, and so Carol Dunham. It's, it's a similar thing. I think that's uh, that's definitely there. How much it has to do with the wood, I don't know. Maybe this idea of permission to to do the props, to have those you know uh -huh. boxes or predellas or whatever you want to call them, you know, permission to to go you know go out into left field and do uh, have a kind of sculptural um, you know to make sculptural surfaces. I think that's where Elizabeth uh, comes in. Uh -huh. um, I mean we visited her together upstate. Um, so uh, she was very, you know, up, up until very, un very much on her mind. Um, um, you know, as, you know, uh, as has been mentioned before, a real mentor. Um, but in a way, where does the mentor, I mean, where does the mentor, um, I mean, you can be a mentor, but not you know, not be, be influenced by the work, be a mentor, but there's also a point where you leave that behind, but they're mm -hmm. still very influential or still important for you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, they opened a path, you know, yeah. just like she opened a path for younger artists yeah. uh, after her, you know, uh, Elizabeth and, and artists uh, like that opened a path for, for Moira. Yeah. A new path. Yeah. Yeah. It could be, but it, 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 they, they open the path, but they, you know, she, um, but it was enough just to do that, you mm -hmm. know, um, she didn't have to go in that direction. Uh, she, she, mm -hmm. she, she went her own way, mm -hmm. but it, it, the fact that they did that allowed her to go her own way. You know, I, I guess I don't know if that makes sense, but no, that makes sense. It's yeah, that's that's what it is. And uh, you get kind of permission to, to do something, and then you just go take it from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I I really think that uh, in many ways, if we want to talk about real influences, and uh, you know, um, we could go into this pre-Renaissance, um, I mean, all the greats, Giotto mm -hmm. and um, Fra Angelico, I mean, there, I think she, she was really excited about that work. Yeah, I'm gonna take that moment to interject and say, I think we're supposed to be moving on to questions and there is a question just about that. So um, I will ask the question and then we can talk more about that. Um, Moira went to Italy with Victor in 1982. She saw a lot of painting on panels and the segmented works of altarpieces. Can you talk a bit about that influence? And I think Valerie, you were starting to, and we see that also in her archive and in the collection of postcards that she kept and notes on writing and influences that um, were in her studio. I think also not just the altar pieces and the panels, but the colors. As I was looking through the postcards that she kept of Italian painters specifically, I could look into those images and see the exact same colors and even um, forms and um, brush strokes really that they were using up here in her work. I, I think um, if, you want to talk about we have to go to Reston on our images mm -hmm. and the very very early work um uh yeah like that one with the crown the, the crown of thorns yeah. and the one and the one next to it 
um, we don't have a close up of it, but some of those kinds of faded blues and greens, um, I think the colors um, were, you know, really important for her. Also, um, you know, I, I think so many people respond to Giotto because um, unlike um, Pierre um, Della Francesca, the the expression, you know, was so so strong. I mean, this. Um, how do you? I mean, every I, I don't know. Every artist wants to um, aspire to that uh, incredible um, spiritual feeling, um, or some, or the equivalent of something like that. You know, you make. Or it doesn't even have to be a painter or an artist any kind of artist, writer, you know, how do you have that kind of impact? Um, and I think she was really blown away by it. And, and, and you know, it was inspiring for her and she wanted to have that for, for, her, for herself in her work. Yeah, in, in, in my interview with her, she, she talks about Pier della Francesca and she talks about, she calls it, the genuine religious feeling that she that that is in that work and and that she found very seductive and I think she really picked up on that very strongly. Yeah. Yeah. Who wouldn't? Yeah. <laughs> um, are we going to are we going to take some of these uh, questions or? Yes. So that was the first, and there's one more question, and we are getting close to time, so. Mm -hmm. If you have questions out there, please enter them now. I'm going to turn to them um, exclusively at this point. Um, so here's another one. Nobody mentioned Mary Heilman, but I see more about Mary Heilman in her work than Elizabeth Murray or Tip Dunham or et cetera. Can you please talk about this possible connection or non-connection? Um, I, I don't know if I can answer that. Um, I think Mary, um, you know, it's been so long. <laughs> I would be making things up, but you know, so many women artists of that you know generation were important for her. Um, I'm sure she looked at, I, you know, but again, I don't know for sure, but I would imagine that she was looking at Mary's work. Um, but. Um, you know, I, I can't be specific about it. So what do you say, Klaus? Um, I, I, I can't answer that one actually either. I mean, there were a lot of uh, women, uh, really interesting women artists active and coming and, and coming out uh, and, and those uh, during that time. I wasn't personally really um, aware of Mary's work at that time, to be honest. I don't know if uh, if Moira was, uh, but I can see there's you know there's a, there's certainly some commonalities be, be, between her and many other artists um, at the time. I, I think I mentioned Jennifer Bolandi in my essay, um, so um, I'm sorry I don't really have a, a good answer. I mean the poppy there's a kind of poppy sense. Um, maybe it's on the back wall from this uh, those. You know, debutante and um, or debutante is in the, at the Phillips. Correct. Um, um, yeah. The playfulness. Um, I think of uh, maybe uh, who mentioned it? Uh, Ree Morton. Uh, Carolyn Alexander was showing a lot of mm -hmm. Ree Morton's work. Yeah. And, and we were all looking at it. It was like, whoa, Definitely. where did this woman come from? <laughs> You know, um, and I think, you know, Moira was uh, with us on that, you know, um, so, uh, you know, so I see some of that there. I see that too. Uh, I wasn't aware of Ree Morton at that time when I knew Moira, but now when I, when I see, uh, you know, Ree Morton's work, I think of Moira, <laughs> so, you know, it just pops up. So I, I think there's definitely, you know, and I think that's this, there, there's there's a lot of shared aesthetics and uh, of of artists uh, at that time. 
and and this green one um this the what is it called the stripe or something mm -hmm. um you know there um you know i i, I think of um uh, of um jessica stockholder mm -hmm. um but there were so many before that judy faff um anything that was painting that was um you know coming being sculpture um uh I, I think you know she she saw that she she was aware of that um but she never stuck with it there are these single pieces it didn't go anywhere in the way that um this this piece here the you know the whole series of um fingerprints that developed into um ek what are they called? EKGs and you know waves and um, uh, you know seismic kind of um, earthquake type of um, or rift zones. Mm -hmm. uh, you know she has whole body of that uh, of that work. Um, this piece and the nightly news. She didn't go. She didn't go further with it, it seemed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of works that are very unique and singular. And uh, you know, like the, the one with the two con concentric um, spheres, the red one, green one, you know, that's very unusual. And um, so, and that's what, what I think was one of her strengths. She she experimented a lot, but she you know but but she didn't wear things out. She had an idea, and then that was it. And then she went moved on to something else. Yes, well, that's the the you know we're talking about a very what is it ten years, Lily? Really, not even. Yeah. Mm. So. You know, so um, she was, but in that, in those 10 years, she did a lot of experimenting, right. really incredible. Um, so uh, she was, she, she got a lot, a lot done. Um, and that there's one more question that's been submitted um, somewhat related to that. Her life was short. Breast cancer was unfortunately a big part of it, but how much of that infused her work is a matter of some conjecture. I wonder if Valerie might comment on that. Is it the elephant in the room or a mouse? Larger than an elephant, mm -hmm. I would say. Mm. Yeah, I think um, the work after the works that are in this exhibition, I think really all become about illness. And um, yeah, I mean, what, I mean, put, oh. let's try to put ourselves in those shoes. I mean, I mean that she even was able to do any work <laughs> is quite remarkable. I think um, it, it's total rage, total rage, you know, um, there. But still, she she was able to control it, and she it she came up with th this work. So, I mean, how do you do that if there's not that kind of um, you know? Maybe it was a relief in some way. There was a distance that she could somehow translate that onto onto a surface. Um, I, I know it's, it, it, it's, I just feel there's a lot of uh, conf conflict. I mean, I don't know. There. How does, how does someone continue working under those conditions? It, it, uh, maybe it's a kind of almost necessity because you, do continue to live, mm -hmm. you know, so there's... And this is all that remains, you know, of you, exactly. so... Exactly. So you do feel like, mm -hmm. I got to get it down, 
-hmm. you know, I'm making a statement, I got to get it down. This is me, I'm here. Um, so, yeah. And we know she was in her studio all the way up to the end, making work. Yeah, she was. Mm. She was. I, what are the other comments? Um, there are some comments in the Q&A. That is all the formal questions. Um, comment about back to Italian painting. I don't think it's even about Italian in quotes and all caps painting, but pre-Renaissance medieval or Sienese type Italian painting. Uh -huh. Just my two cents. I think I agree. <laughs> um, and I don't really agree about artists of that time for females, very few role models with paint that feels so easy and yet formal. Hmm. That's what someone said. Mm -hmm. Shall I name commenters? <laughs> it was <laughs> wait, wait a minute. I made that comment. <laughs> what was it? I don't know any women painters that what? I don't really agree about artists of that time for females, very few role models with paint that feels so easy and yet formal. Oh, uh, in terms of role models. Yeah, but she's, you know, it doesn't have to be a single person. You know, it certainly wasn't with her. I don't think it is with anybody. I mean, you know, ideas are free. You just grab them and go with it, right? We all do. So, um, you know, she took from Elizabeth. She took from, from probably Sherry, from... Re Morton from, you know, as Klaus mentioned, even Jenny Belandi, even though she was, Jenny wasn't a photographer as Klaus, you know, says, she, she's just playing with images. So is Moira, you know, the medium is different, but they're still, you know, that's the, con this, I think the more important issue is really um, this issue of what it means to be a conceptual painter. Um, or, or maybe that's an old issue for, you know, women painters, but I think that's an interesting issue um, and how that manifests itself. And I mean, um, Richter, uh, that, that's always something that people say about Richter, um, but they, they don't really say it about women uh, painters, or at least I haven't heard that they do. And um, I'm, I'm curious about what, how, you know, how that can happen or how one can talk about that. Um, maybe that's a different conference. <laughs> <laughs> well, I keep thinking about, I mean, it's conflating a few ideas, but um, conceptual art with a capital C and thinking about minimalism and plywood and materials and um, how Moira uses the material of plywood, thinking about conceptualism and um, maybe as a feminist gesture, I don't know, kind of reclaiming the material and taking it for painting instead of for sculpture, um, playing with those lines. It's a thought that I've, kind of been working through but keep coming back to and that there is some relationship there maybe in in her writings and in her notes on what she was reading and looking at there is a lot of mention of um you know the big male conceptual artist that she was looking at and I can't help but think um referencing and maybe even poking fun at a little bit in her way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think what's interesting is the way she painted, again, this, this. Um, how do you, I mean, I, I don't, 
know how to talk about it, but it's these this kind of wash, you know. So it's not. Does it mean when you use that casein? Casein. Does it mean that you're not really painting? Mm. Is it, it's a kind of wash that soaks in, it doesn't remain on the surface. Is that another kind of mm. a denial of the paint or the, the whole materiality of the paint, yet it's still there, it's, you can still see it. Mm. Um, the drips, she wanted to keep all that, all the little quirky aspects of it there. Um, but it's it's not you know it's not substantial it's it's um it's like water almost oh. and i wonder if that choice has something to do with this you know the this idea of, I think this is a note that she wrote, making visible the invisible. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a highly conceptual kind of observation. I think that is a perfect ending, as I was just <laughs> given the note that it's time to wrap up. Um, thank you both very, very much. Can I just mention yes. that the exhibition is still open until uh, at the Phillips until December 13. And we are open now uh, with social distancing. We are only open uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. And you have to get a ticket in advance, but it's free. Um, and so there is still a chance to see this beautiful show. And isn't we got the catalog. Oh yes, and we have a catalog. And isn't Reston still open for another few days or am I wrong? Like the seventh, it closes on the seventh? On Saturday is the last day. All right. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.